I have not gotten that criticism, so I don't. Uh, well, so yeah, so Shapiro was here. Shapiro, Shapiro was here, and Patton was here, and Stankus was here, and Gu was here, although I never had him for any classes. Um, but Linda and Mark, so Stankus and Patton are both uh, students of my advisor. So we all have the same, we all went to UC San Diego, we all have the same academic advisor. So we're like mathematical siblings. So I've known, I've known, I've known Linda and, and Mark for a long time. So like I borrowed, I borrowed a book from Sankus when I was a grad student. I never gave it back to him. And it's like 25 years I've had this book. So it's not, not quite that long. But at some point I'm gonna give him that book back and say, hey Mark, here's your, here's your book, which has a note on it that says, please bring this back. So I will it's in my garage somewhere. I like 350. I, I, I really enjoyed teaching that class. That's uh, mathematical programming. It's done in Mathematica when like I taught the class the way that Lee's wrote the class. So I, and, uh, so I taught basically Lee's class and that's all in Mathematica. Um, I would teach the class, I would be happy to teach the class in, um, in, in MATLAB as well. But the thing about MATLAB is MATLAB is like a numerical language and you're going to get a if you take the numerical sequence, you're going to be swimming in MATLAB. So, like, if I was going to change languages in 350, I'd be teaching it of Python instead, probably. Um, so, that's analysis. I mean, the thing is, it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be the case that if you learn, if you learn a language, if you learn how to program in one language, you should be able to program in any language, right? That's what they. That's what. That's what. That's the theory of how it works. Yeah. If you don't like that. <laughs> yes, actually, so we're all, so our, so our department, um, it's the last thing I'll say here before I start. So our department is um, almost all the people who do analysis in the department, so are complex analysts. So yeah, so Linda and Mark are operator theorists. And I am, which is like infinite dimensional linear algebra, basically. Um, I'm a function theorist, which means I use infinite dimensional matrices to study functions. Um, and then uh, Shapiro is an operator theorist, and Gu is an operator theorist, and Purse is an operator theorist. So, like, there's a whole lot of us in the department. They're basically all complex analysis. And then there's Retzak, who I think is a real, he, he does real analysis, but he's kind of, he's, so he's from a different, a different sort of mathematical branch. But yeah, it's weird that we're all sort of collected here. Um, okay. What the heck were we talking about? Oh, yeah, linear combinations. Okay, so if I close my eyes, now the class is beginning right now. So I'm going to close my eyes for a second. I'm going to randomly point a direction. I'm just kidding. So somebody raise their hand. Somebody brave. Somebody brave. Raise their hand. Tell me what a linear combination is. And if you don't, I'm going to randomly generate a number on my computer and I'm going to count desks until I find somebody to tell me what a linear combination is. Yeah. Okay, so you have pieces of what we're after here. You have this part of it. Okay, but you use the word set. Yep. A summation of? A sum of, okay. You were going to say? Usually, like, when you're operating the I show, like, the vector. Okay. Okay, yeah. All of this is right, right? All of it's right. But what I want you to think when you think linear combination from the definition, is it is a linear combination is a is a, a sum um, yeah it's a sum of the form a1 b1 plus a2 b2 all the way up to am bm where a1 up to am uh, are all contained in the field right it's a you pick up a bunch of scalars you multiply those with vectors you add them up you've got a linear combination okay somebody else Somebody else, tell me what 
what this symbol means. Yep. The set of all linear this, okay, that is the best possible way to say it. The set of all linear combinations of okay. set of all linear combinations of D1 up to Dm or in set building notation. Okay, what does it mean for two subspaces to be a direct sum? If I say u plus v is a direct sum, what do I mean? Yep. Uh, there's only one way to pass the sum, and it's the intersection. That's absolutely one part of it, right? So you have one part of it. So the first is anything in it has a unique representation u plus v. So if w is in u plus v, then w is equal to u plus v for a unique u in u and v in v. And then you also tagged on the most important theorem about checking it, which is that like, you know, it's a direct sum if and only if the intersection of U and V is zero, but we're missing something here. There's an important piece of this definition that we're missing. What do I need to know about U and V for any of this to make any sense? They gotta be subspaces, right? So U and V, U and V is a direct sum of subspaces U and V if all of this follows. Okay. What are the definitions that we have here that we need? Yeah, of course. Do U and V have to be subspaces of the same vector? Space? Yeah, I mean, that's intrinsic here is that there's some overarching. Yeah, I mean, there actually is a way of formally defining a, a, a new space out of direct summing things that aren't related to each other, but that's like higher level version of this. So like a formal direct sum exists. Okay, so if any of those terms were things that you're not familiar with, get them in your head because at some point here, the randomizer is coming and I'm gonna be calling on everybody silent. Any questions before we start? Yeah. So like fully defined direct sum, you mean direct sum? Yes. You, I mean, the thing is you want that stuff because if you're asked to use it on a homework problem or exam, usually what will happen is all of it will be necessary. You'll need to make sure that you've got all the bits you need, right? So in a direct sum, those are usually, and they involve things like working on, you know, you're working on some Hilbert space and you've chopped it up into piece of some direct sum. You need to know both that these guys themselves individually are closed under addition and closed under scaling multiplication. So it's important that you know that they're subspaces. Yep. Um, if you're doing direct sum with more than two subspaces, what's the best way to make sure you can't use that? So if you're working on that's the that's if you're working on multiple subspaces, that's when you show that zero has a unique. So if you have like u1 direct sum u2 direct sum u3 up to direct sum um. There you use the proposition that if zero has a unique representation as zero plus zero plus zero plus zero, then this was originally a direct sum. Okay. okay. So yeah, you can't use the intersection thing. Although, uh, in, in fact, it's worse than that. I don't know. Yeah, Axler points this out in the text. I don't remember if I assigned it as a homework problem. You can actually find examples where pairwise everything does not intersect. Everything intersects to zero pairwise, but you still don't have a direct sum when you glue it all together. So you're right. You can't use this for. for Any other questions? You guys are, I, I'll just point out that you guys are doing a really good job of asking questions in this, in this class so far, right? A lot of these ideas deserve clarification. All right, where were we at? We had gotten down to, um, okay. Had we proved, last time did we prove the span is the smallest sub, uh, subspace? I think I, I stated the theorem, but I don't think I proved it, right? Okay, so what we're going to prove this time, so we're going to start with the proof of a, an important proposition about why we even deal with span at all, which is 
So I'm going to call this a theorem. Is that? I think I, I, I argued that it was a subspace, but I didn't show it with the smallest one. Right? I, I think I argued that it's obvious that it's, that it's got, satisfies the closure properties, but I don't think I actually showed that it, it's, it's, it's the smallest such subspace. So the theorem says the span of V1 up to Vm is the smallest subspace containing V1 up to Vm. Now, why do you know the definitions? Because this theorem is nonsense. Right, it's just it's just gobbledygook unless you know that that you know what span means, right? If you know, oh, it's the space of all linear combinations, like then this theorem makes sense. If you don't know that, and I write this down as say, oh, I don't know, an exam problem, say show this thing, you know, show this as a subspace, and you don't know what the span is, you're not going to make any progress at all. Okay, that's not a warning, by the way. Although I could ask that question. Yep. Is this similar to like the uh, sum of like subspaces? Yes. Want... It's very similar. Right. The difference is with subspaces, you start with the sum of subspaces, you start with subspaces and you add them up in all possible ways. Here we're starting with a set of vectors. So it's like we're stepping one step back from subspaces. I'm starting with discrete collection of vectors, right? A list of vectors. So some finite number of vectors. And I'm saying, okay, how can I build a closed space that contains that list of vectors? And it turns out this is the way that you do it. Okay, so but the argument is very similar. Okay, so to prove this, first you have to show that the span is a subspace. So part one, span of E1 up to Vm is a subspace. And so the argument is for the, the, the standard sort of, okay, A. Zero is in the span. Because zero is equal to zero v one plus zero v two up to zero v m. Not a very interesting linear combination, but it's definitely in there. Okay. So since zero is a linear combination of the v's, zero is in the span. Two, pick two elements in the span. Okay, so I'm going to pick. A1, V1, up to AM, VM, that's in the span. And I'm also going to pick a different vector, B1, V1, that's in the span. And if you add those vectors together, it should be pretty obvious that if you start with a linear combination of V's and you add it to another linear combination of V's, it's just by collecting the scalar, uh, you know, collecting like terms, you get another linear combination. Of the piece, right? That's a linear combination of the vectors V1 through Vm. That's a linear combination of the vectors V1 through Vm. If you add them and collect like terms, you get scalar times V1 plus scalar times V2 out to scalar times Vm. So this object is also in the space. If I'm doing a step like this and you don't exact understand exactly why what I'm saying is true, make sure you stop me, okay? What I'm arguing here is that if you add these two things together, you get another one back out again just by algebra. Okay. What's that? It's obviously. It's obviously in this band. I mean, it's insulting to say that in a book, although it doesn't stop text off book authors from saying it anyway, but yeah. Clearly. Okay, so part C of the argument is to show that this thing is close to just the multiplication. To do so, we're going to pick a K in the field. We pick a K in the field, and we pick an A1, V1 up to AM, VM in span. And to be closed under scalar multiplication means we have to show that this is in the span. But just by distribution, we get K A1 times V1 plus K A2 times V2 up to K A M times VM, which is also a linear combination of the V's. 
with coefficients Ka1, Ka2, Ka3, and so on. And so this is in the fan. So that's a subfix. In fact, the whole reason, I think I said last time, the whole reason we defined span the way that we did was to make sure that this was a subspace. Span is expressly defined to make sure that it's a subspace. Now comes the annoying part of the argument where we have to show it's the smallest sub such sub such sub, sub smallest such subspace. So to do so, we are going to show. So this is a sort of an aside to ourselves. We will show that if a subspace U of B contains B1 up to Bm, then U also contains the span of B1 to Bm. If I have any other subspace containing those vectors, then it must also contain the whole of the span. Right. And if we can do that, that would look that this is precisely what we need by it being the smallest subspace containing B1 through Bm. Then any other subspace containing the vectors contains the span too. The logic of that makes sense? Okay. Okay. So um, I guess the first thing that we need to note here is that certainly it's the case that the span contains, and so certainly. That's an insulting mathematical word, but we'll put it in here anyway. Certainly, Vi is in the span of V1 to Vn for all i, because each Vi can be written as 0v1 plus 0v2. Go out until you get to the ith component and write one next to it, and then put zeros in all the rest of the Vs. So the vectors themselves do live in the span. Not a deep fact, but one that's probably important to note. Right? So the span does contain the vectors B1 to B. So how do we conclude? Suppose U is a subspace V and V1 up to Vm are elements of U. What we want to conclude here is that any linear combination of V1 through Vm is also in U. Is that true? Why? I mean, if that's true, why is it true? What I'd like to conclude, like, so we know what the conclusion we want is, which is that A1 V1 up to Am Vm is also in U. If we knew this fact was true for any linear combination, that would mean the span lived inside you because this is every element of the span looks like this. Why is it true that if these guys all live in a subspace that all of their linear combinations do as well? Can you be more precise? So yes, there is the subspaceness of it. Because subspaces are closed rigid, and so therefore you can take any of the vectors that are redundant out of the linear that's it's a, so, and there's a subtlety here that I want to point out. So you're right, it's closure that does it, which is probably what you're suggesting with the subspace comment, right? So this is actually one of the places where the fact that we're only ever dealing with finite lists comes into play as well. Because with a finite list, you can imagine you can always work two at a time. Remember when we when we defined what it meant to be closed under scalar multiplication and addition, we talked about with pairwise addition, right? We didn't talk about what happens with infinite addition. With pairwise addition, I can say, well, add these two, and those are still in the space. And then I've got another one, so add that into the pile. And I've got another one, so add it into the pile. It's like finite induction, basically, right? If I had an infinite list, I got a, I got a problem, because it's possible, if I have an infinite list of vectors, I have to define what it means to converge. And I don't, I don't want to do that. So I want to point out there's a subtlety here in that we're using the finiteness of lists when we, when we set this up. So because we're dealing with a finite list, 
the fact that we have closure under scalar multiplication and, uh, and vector addition means, so closure properties of subspaces plus finiteness gives us this. Well, I mean, you can go to, like, I'm allowed to get away with that because I'm giving the big thematic version of this, right? I mean, Axler, I'm trying to clarify, a lot of times what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to give you a clarification of the arguments that Axler makes. Axler's arguments a lot of times don't include these thematic ideas about why he's making the steps that he does, right? Often they do, but sometimes they don't. And so I'm trying to tell you that whatever move Axler makes in here, essentially what he's doing is invoking closure properties. And he absolutely loves to make the move like, it's a finite list. You can just use finite induction on it, right? So he does that. And so the sense these guys are in here, of course, any pairwise sum will be in here. I can pairwise sum all of these guys. All the scalar multiples are inside by closure properties. So essentially, take your list of vectors, multiply them all by the correct scalars, add them all together. You stay inside the space. And so any linear combination must also be in here. Is that right? So the span of V1 up to Vm is also contained inside of you. And that's precisely what we mean by the smallest such subspace. Every element of the span is contained in you. And so as a subset, it is contained inside. Can you repeat that sentence again? Every element of the span is of this form. Every element of this form is in you. And so therefore, the span is contained in you. It's just an element-wise subset argument. It's definitely possible that the span could be equal to the whole space for sure. Now, the reason why is because uh, different books and different authors are terribly lazy about like if they specify subset equal versus subset, and sometimes they just say, "Oh, you figure it out, right?" So this this could mean subset subset equal, or that could mean it. Like I don't know. Reading math is 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 difficult because people aren't stable about the notation. Yep. Why do you bring in the why do I bring in what? Like, we don't really use it. Like so the reason that, the, I mean, the, what V gives us is the operations that we want. It, v gives us the envelope that this all takes place in. And it makes sure that we can use closure properties to identify subspaces without having to refer to the vector addition. It's like, if we don't have a V, we have to verify all of those properties to make sure that we're even in a vector space at all. Right? So by saying U to subspace, Guarantee it? I mean, I have to tell you what it's the subspace of, right? Okay. I, I can't just say, I mean, it's bad practice, it's bad form, I guess, to say something is a subspace without referring to something it's a subspace of. Yes, okay. you're right. It's implicit that I say you as a subspace that is a subspace of something. Okay. And this thing that's a subspace of is a, is, is a vector space. For sure, that's true, right? So, yeah, so if you left this off, are you wrong? Not really, right? But it's going to matter sometimes what the overarching space is. So it's a good practice to make sure when you say subspace that you know that you mean subspace of something. Yep. Um, so is this a subspace to say that the span is the smallest? Um, yeah, can you explain why? Like how is that like the word smallest and this group? So, okay, so when I say smallest as a subset, I mean any other set. So if span is the smallest subspace, I mean, if any other subspace contains the vectors, then it also contains the span. There's no smaller subspace of the span that also contains all of the V1 through Vn. So you can imagine the logic that you should think here is that down here, you have this, this discrete list, V1 up to Vm, right? And we're saying these are contained certainly these are contained as elements of this vector space. These vectors are in there. And we're saying, if there's another subspace that these things are vectors of, the only way to draw the picture is like this. If there's any other subspace that these things belong to, automatically the span is also inside of it. This is what I mean by the span is the smallest sub so such object. Yeah, that the collection of all possible linear combinations of the vectors is the, is the least amount of vectors you need to make sure everything's closed under addition and scalar multiplication. Okay. Thank you. Yep. How does the span get bigger? 
would that just depend on like the what do you how, how can i make a subspace that's larger you mean like if the span is like the basic amount of elements like the smallest amount of like width that you have or uh -huh. like how would you make it bigger how does it get bigger than that if everything you add could be represented okay so imagine that we're in say r3 okay i'm going to give you a list of vectors There's some vectors in R3, right? What's the span of this? Everything of the form A times one zero zero plus B times two zero zero, right? A times the first vector plus B times the second one. That's the definition of the span, right? Every possible combination of these two guys. Okay, so I want you to imagine that what comes out of this is, well, basically it's, there, it's just vectors that look like this. Right? Okay, I think that was my question. So two, okay, this might be going ahead. Two, zero, zero isn't linearly long. We're going to talk okay. about this. Okay. Yes. So if you have linear dependence in the set of vectors that you start with, then what ends up happening is that the size of the span, the, 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 the span that comes out is smaller than the number of vectors that you feed in. So is the span a list of um, like linearly independent vectors? It's not a list because a list is finite, right? It's a subspace of linear. Uh, OK, so you got to be careful here. The span does not have anything to do with linear independence. It's a completely separate idea, which is why we can define it before we even talk about what it means to be linearly independent. Okay. So if you give me 30 minutes, I can define linear independence and then we can talk about how these things hook up with each other. Okay. You're on the right track, though. There's questions here about like how big this actually can be, yeah. right? There's like, it's a fundamental importance is how big this, this, this can actually be. Okay. So. That was the end of that. Span of the list of values, spans the. Okay, so now we've got the last idea of this set of notes, which was there's a little bit extra piece of vocabulary. Make sure you've got this straight because this is where these words are getting all tangled up to each other. If B is equal to the span of V1 up to VM. If you have a space and it is the span of a collection of vectors, then we have two more vocabulary terms. We say V1 up to Vm spans V. Or we might say V1 to Vm is a spanning set for V. So we've got span, spans, and spanning sets. Because why not? If V is equal to a span of vectors, yep. It, yeah, V. Every time we write V in here, ever, I always mean vector space. Yep. This doesn't guarantee that those vectors are linear. So we can just oh no, no. Nope. We'll get there. Yep. Is there any difference between saying that? No, nope. They just this is like the reason that I'm laying this out now is because both of this, both of these uses of language come up all the time, and I want to make sure nobody's confused about like exactly what this means. Okay, so the span of a set of vectors is a vector space, but the vectors can be said to span a space if their span is the vector space. That's not confusing at all. Okay, so now without reference to anything about dimension, we're going to define what finite dimensional is. But I'm, without referring to dimension at all. So Axler makes the following amusing definition. A space is finite dimensional if 
contains a list of vectors that spans it. Why, why would that mean finite dimensional? Yep. It's a, list. a list. And list means finite to the actor, right? <laughs> when he says list, he means finite. So what we're saying is if I can find some vectors living inside of V, so the idea here is you start with a V. If you can find a V1 up to Vm so that V is equal to the span of V1 up to Vm, then V is finite dimensional. Now notice, I haven't told you the optimal number of vectors at all. Those of you that remember your 206 are going to think, oh my god, we're so close to dimension and basis here. But not yet. Not yet. All I'm saying is something is finite dimensional if it's in the span of a finite set of vectors. OK, now, the, <laughs> the hilarious definition of infinite dimensional is something is infinite dimensional if it is not finite dimensional. Uh, is the definition, another definition is infinite dimensional if it's not finite dimensional. And of course, you can think about the implications of what that means, right? To not be finite dimensional means there is no finite collection of vectors where everything in V can be written as a linear combination of those, right? So you need, if you want to write linear combinations in V to get all of V, you need infinite number of vectors to do it with. But the reason, I know this seems kind of weird. The reason we're setting up the logic like this is because we want to be able to refer to finiteness and infiniteness without having to refer to dimension specifically. Okay. So here are some spaces that are finite dimensional. I don't might surprise you to know Fn is finite dimensional. Which includes examples like good old R2. Now notice at this point in the class, we can't actually say that R2 is two-dimensional, even though it is. All we can say is that R2 is finite dimensional. <laughs> Why do we know it's finite dimensional? Because R2 is equal to the span of 1, 0, and 0, 1. Oh, wait. Somebody told me that vertical vectors hurt their brains. So let's write horizontal vector. R2 is equal to the span of 1, 0, and 0, 1. <coughs> there we go. There's some horizontal vectors for you. Yep. Can you say like two dimensional? Do you just mean like? Oh, I can't. We don't know what two dimensional means yet. <laughs> That's what I'm telling you. We can't say that. Don't say it. We don't know. There's no such thing as two. We're not. Don't. We're not going to construct the integers. Yeah. So we don't. don't yeah. We we want to be really careful about like the idea of how we define what it means to be dimensional. But we need to know more before we can say that. All right. Okay. Okay. So it would be nice. If we had an infinite dimensional set to work with, even though, even though we're not going to do much in the way of infinite dimensional vector spaces, there's a really useful example of an infinite dimensional vector space that we want all the time. And that is the polynomial. So a function, or sorry, a polynomial. Coefficients in F function with Z of the form with Z equal to A naught. Plus a one z a m e to the m for all z in the field. 
Oh, there was a thunder. That was shocking. And you can apply anything in the field into it. The point here is that the coefficients come from the right field, right? So we have, we're going to be considering polynomials with real coefficients and polynomials with complex coefficients. Polynomial is just what you think it is. He's using Z because a lot of times we think of polynomials as taking complex inputs, although we're very rarely going to be evaluating a polynomial here. Okay. Z in the field, is that, what does that mean? That would be like P is a function that goes from F to F. If you were to evaluate it, then the inputs have to come from whatever the field happens to be. So we're talking vectors there? No, no, no. Remember, F is just scalars, right? This okay, is a, yeah. So we're just, we're, what we're talking about with a polynomial is if I had a, so say I wanted a real polynomial, then I would say P of X is equal to, say, 2 plus X plus 3X squared would be a real valued polynomial if X came from the real numbers. This is a polynomial that takes the reals into the reals. And so this would be a polynomial with coefficients in R. Whereas something like p of x is equal to i plus x plus 3x squared, that would be a polynomial over the complex coefficients. And here we would think of, I guess we'd be careful and say z here instead. Here we would think of the inputs as being complex numbers. So what, what space the coefficients live in tells you what the inputs are allowed to be. Yep. Well, it's what's going to happen is if you go f to f, if you go from r to r, and you evaluate on real coefficients, you're always going to get a real number out. So we're sort of restricting ourselves into a world of polynomials where real numbers go in and real numbers go out with real coefficients, and a world where complex numbers go in and complex numbers come out with complex coefficients. You can, but then you would consider that to be in the family of polynomials that were, that were complex. I mean, the reason that we have to set it up this way is because in linear algebra, we have to be precise about the domains and ranges of these things to make, for these things to make sense as vectors. Yeah. Okay, so we're gonna say fancy P of F is the set of all polynomials with coefficients in F. Here's a claim you could prove if you're sitting around with nothing to do. Thinking, man, there's nothing on Netflix. They cancel every show I like. You'd say, oh, you know what? I'm going to prove that the set of all polynomials is a vector space. I'll do it while I'm eating my dinner. I'll just prove that. It's not hard to show, right? That it's a vector space under regular old polynomial addition and scalar multiplication, right? That's left to you. But the, the classical math language way of writing that is to say left to reader. Left is an exercise. Okay, so a polynomial has degree M if. Uh, there exists A not up to AM uh, in the field, and AM is not zero if B of B is A not plus A one Z. Essentially, this is keeping track of what the highest power of z that occurs in a polynomial is, right? It's standard. This is a one way of getting the standard idea of what the degree of a polynomial is. Yep. Why is the definition based on the coefficients and not the power? Ah, because what's going to happen eventually is we're trying to associate the coefficients with vectors is what's going to happen in the long term. And so the focus of, for, for us, when in linear algebra context, the focus of polynomials is not the powers of z. It's going to be the coefficient list. This is the thing that ends up looking like a vector in, in F M plus one, right? So when we deal with polynomials, we are focusing on the coefficients, not the variables. So that's why we're defining it this way. It just happens to agree 
with our calculus definition of the highest power of z that occurs with a non-zero coefficient. But because our focus is on coefficients, we are going to do it in terms of coefficients. Okay, so if such a thing holds, we say the degree of p is m. And here we go. Yep. Um, when you say like, does this, like why do you think that there exists like these like uh, numbers like? Because, well, I mean, because we're, we're sort of working formally, right? Is the first thing logically, right? So if I say something is a polynomial in, 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 with coefficients in the field, I need to know that I have a pile of, I mean, the important thing here is that there exists a list of coefficients and there's a largest one that is not zero, right? That's the, that, that, that's the thing I'm after, right? Again, remember, we're forcing the coefficients to exist because we're thinking of, we're ultimately gonna be thinking about this thing as a vector and the coefficients encode the information about what the, what the vector is. And then when you say largest one, it, why is A of M the largest one? Um, just because I, because of the way I set the notation of A, M, the, the subscript tells us the power of Z that goes with it. So I'm going to associate these things with different powers of Z. And if, the, I mean, if A, M plus, if this is zero, I mean, would you say, what degree is this? I have to terminate the list somewhere, right? I mean, I could put as many, yeah. is this a third degree polynomial? No. Not according to our definition, the answer is no. We want to make sure that we're very clear about what we mean by degree, right? So we're not going to allow this to extend to infinity because I want to lock these things off into finite dimensional subspaces. And so that means I have to terminate these lists, which is why I need this not zero condition. Aren't these A's just like arbitrary elements of fields? No, they're not arbitrary. They're like ordered? A like polynomial. So the idea here is, they're not, I mean, you can imagine that they're ordered because they're associated with these powers of Z. So yes. They are ordered because they're attached to particular powers of Z. Are they like, but they're not like least to greatest? Thing? What do you mean least I'm to just, greatest? I'm just confused why you're like, well, we have to specify A of M is not equal to zero. Okay, so here's one of the weirdest, why I have to specify A M is not zero. Why? If I can't find one, then I'm looking at the zero polynomial, right? A polynomial that's identically zero. Okay. Oh, I guess okay. If, e of z is identically zero, the polynomial that spits out zero for everything, then the degree of p is equal to minus infinity. Because this doesn't exist. It's not well-defined argument. We've got to fill in the gap. What Axer says to make it convenient, he says, okay, well, if you're the zero polynomial, your degree is minus infinity. So if you're a constant, your degree is zero. If you have a first term, your degree is one. I mean, it, these are ordered because they're attached to different powers of Z, right? Okay. A1 is exactly the coefficient that goes with Z to the first. A2 is exactly the coefficient that goes with Z to the two. So they're not ordered by which one is bigger and which one is smaller. They're ordered by which power of Z they're stuck onto. Okay, again, the whole point of this abstractly is that what we're gonna say is this. If I have p of z is equal to 1 plus 2z plus 3z squared, say, is there any other polynomial that can do that? Does any other polynomial with different coefficients have the same graph as this thing does? No, I'm saying, okay, yeah, that, that's the point of the definition is to clip this off so that this is unique because what we want to say is, and we use this all the time. When you guys were in calculus, maybe without thinking about it, but a polynomial is determined by its coefficients. You give me a pile of coefficients with this condition, and I give you the unique polynomial that it gives rise to. There's a unique relationship between the set of coefficients of the polynomial and the polynomial it produces. So thematically in the long term, what we're going to do with all this machinery, the abstraction of this machinery is we're going to say, well, this one, two, one plus two Z plus three Z squared is sort of, I'm going to use the word isomorphic here, but don't get scared by that. That really this object contains the same information that this object does. 
the polynomial is uniquely determined by this list, this ordered list of coefficients. And so I have to terminate this list so that I really do get a unique correspondence between a pile of coefficients and the polynomial it's attached to. If I look at that list, can I tell you what degree the polynomial is? Yeah. If I gave you, oh, I'm walking along the street and I kick over a garbage can, underneath the garbage can is this list of numbers. And then somebody says, hey, that's a polynomial. It doesn't look like a polynomial, but what polynomial is it? If you tell me the coefficients, I can tell you the polynomial. If you tell me the polynomial, I can tell you the coefficients. I want this to be unambiguous. I want this relationship to be, if I know coefficients, I know the unique polynomial in a unique representation. And if I know the polynomial, I know the coefficients in a unique representation. Why isn't like even a negative one considered a uh, Well, it is if you work on the Laurent polynomials, but we don't do that in here. Yeah, the idea is that like we're dealing with a version of polynomials where powers are just assumed to be zero or greater. There are extensions of these ideas in other areas of math where polynomials can have negative powers. We're just not doing it. We got to start somewhere. Is that why we have to represent um, polynomials as vectors rather than sets, like these numbers? What do you mean? So yes, you have to have order here. So these are really lists, right? This is a list. It, it's ordered. Repetition doesn't hurt anything. I don't have to sort it from largest to smallest, but I need a slot that goes with the constant, a slot that goes with the first term, a slot with the second, and so on, right? What we're going to end up doing in here, it's okay to spend a couple minutes talking about this. Um, what we're going to end up doing is showing that secretly this vector space, the vector space of polynomials of degree three or less, is the same vector space as R4. They're the same. That's kind of what all this machinery is building towards is that every finite dimensional space, every finite dimensional vector space, every space that looks like this is really just R4 in disguise or F4 if you were in complex concepts, right? So the idea of abstract linear algebra is why should we study this space specifically when we can just do it abstractly and study these? So what we're building up is the machinery that we use to prove that we can move back and forth between these two ways of thinking about what a vector space is. When I've identified something as a vector space, I can move back and forth between different perspectives of thinking about it. And that's why we've got to be careful when we set these definitions up. Yep. Can you say that we can move between them? <laughs> they have to follow every single of the same rule? Uh -huh. So there's an idea that it's going to be way later in the course called isomorphism. And the isomorphism basically is going to give us a way of mathematically consistently doing operations in this space and transforming them into operations in this one. Okay. So that's kind of the, the goal of all of this is to characterize, if I give you a finite dimensional vector space, how can I turn it into Fn and work in it and then go back to the original vector space? Right? So the goal of all of this is all finite dimensional vector spaces secretly are just Fn. How do we do that formally and how do we use it in a higher mathematical uh, context? Okay, so I guess the last thing we'll say today uh, is that we will define Pm of f to be equal to the set of all polynomials of degree m or less. I want you to note emf is equal to the span of 1, z, z squared up to zm. Right? Any polynomial can be written as some coefficient times one plus a coefficient times z plus a coefficient times z squared plus a coefficient times z to the third up to a coefficient times z to the n. Yeah? So is pm finite or infinite dimensional? Why? It is, but why? Well, I guess it's not infinite dimensional, yes, okay. But 
But when we defined what it meant to be finite dimensional, we said, if you can write it as a span of a finite number of vectors, then it's finite dimensional. There are only M plus one of these, right? So this list is finite. That means this is finite dimensional because it's a span of a finite list of vectors. So P M F is finite dimensional. Okay, so after you are done with your dinner and you're on to dessert and you've proved already that the space of polynomials is a vector space, then you can prove that the space PF is infinite dimensional. That's the second thing you can do for dessert. So your dessert proof, your dessert proof could be show that P of F is infinite dimensional. No, <laughs> no, because just because you can show something is the span of an infinite number of vectors doesn't mean you couldn't have found a finite set that does it too. It is a contradiction. See, you're already set for your dessert. All right, so read ahead in this. This is, we are finishing up, we're going to talk about linear independence next time, which is maybe the single most important concept in all of linear algebra. Um, and then we're going to talk about, we're building up to the idea of a basis. So we're going to talk about linear independence, linear dependence, and how you can throw vectors out of a spanning set and, and keep the span the same, which is driving towards the idea of basis. So, all right, I'll see you guys next time.